amazing grace. Number 53. Okay, now we're going to do How Great Thou Art.
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. Let us join together in the call to worship, saying, I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Let us join together in confessing our sins before God, saying, Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. <clears throat> Hear now the good news of the gospel. The saying is completely reliable and should be universally accepted that Christ Jesus entered the world to rescue sinners, that he personally bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that is good. Now who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ and Christ died for us, rose for us, reigns in power for us, and prays for us. If anyone is in Christ, that person becomes a new person altogether. The past is finished and gone. Everything has become fresh and new. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. You may be seated. <clears throat> this year, uh, we are uh, studying during the Lenten season the journey in faith. And a lot of people think, well, that journey, that's only for the pastors and the priests and even the rabbis. But it doesn't have very much to do with me because I work at the Pepsi plant or I work at a school or I, I'm involved in the hospital or whatever. Uh, they're involved in and but we know that every individual Christian has a story to tell every individual Christian has a journey in faith that they go through from the time that they're little kids till the time they're through confirmation and sometimes we don't see them until their middle 30s, 30, 30s when they come back to church here and so we decided to add to the study of the journey in faith witnesses witnesses who share their experience with the journey. Now today we're going to hear from Darlene uh, Waters, and I love Darlene because uh, I know that she has gone through uh, the journey in faith, some of which has been very joyous and some very painful, but nobody can come into the office and relate to Darlene without kind of feeling upbeat because she carries a wonderful smile and and she lifts up people and provides them with opportunities to grow in the knowledge and love of the Lord. And so we're going to hear now from Darlene, who will be the first witness in faith. And next week, uh, backing up uh, Father uh, Joe Bahanek from St. Bridges, we're going to have our president, uh, uh, George Nasner, who's going to talk about his journey in faith. Darlene? Hi, everybody. My journey in faith began in November of 1942 when my parents brought me here to, to church to be baptized. I was entered into the cradle roll department, and when I was old enough, I attended Sunday school. I was also confirmed here in 1955 and joined the junior youth choir and was also an active member of the youth group held here on Friday evenings. When we had a Girl Scout here, I was a scout 
and for a short while was recording secretary of Sunday school. In the early 20s, I became a teacher in the beginner's department where my mom was a teacher and also played the piano. When she passed away in 1968, I had a hard time teaching in that department, so I became a teacher in the primary department for a short while. And in 1978, I was married here at church to Charles F. Sonny Waters. And we, did attend, we didn't attend church regularly until the fall of 1993 when we found out Sonny had a brain tumor. This brought us both back into church on a regular basis. And in January of 1994, Sonny made the transition into eternal life. It was a very hard time for me in my life for we were so close, I didn't know what I was going to do. My faith and my family and friends kept me going. And while going through this period of adjustment, my faith increased. I joined the senior choir in 1994 and had acquired a definite feeling of being part of a family here at church. In the January of 1996, I became assistant church secretary. This is a good job for me because it brought me back to renew friendships I had with church members when I was growing up. I, had a very good I have a very good life because my parents instilled in me the faith that everyone needs to succeed in whatever you may choose. Every time I have a loss or a sickness of any kind, the Lord strengthens my faith and guides me in the right direction to go on. I am very blessed and happy to be part of United Evangelical Church. You may be seated. Good evening. <coughs> I just have two short announcements to make this evening. One of them is the, uh, uh, that the 
to transition into the eternal life of Mark Strobel. Mark Strobel and his wife, Elizabeth, were a part of this church, an integral part of this church for years and years. And they did many things. And uh, Mark used to, when Elizabeth had Alzheimer's, he used to sneak in and he used to go up to the balcony to be with us here to worship and to gain some strength. And then he had to stay with Elizabeth at the Oak Crest Village because she was unable to function really without him. Mark is a, a, a great Christian, a great human being, a kind, loving person. Uh, he was a CPA and, a, and an attorney and a very talented person. Grew up here in Canton like a lot of other good people we're going to hear from this evening. Today I also officiated at a wedding for a guy by the name of Joe Lambert. He's a brother of little John Lambert and Ruby Lambert who had that wonderful uh, surgery, surgical uh, treatment in terms of getting a, a kidney replacement and uh, uh, so it was very painful for her to see her one of her sons die at the age of 41. So we, we celebrated the transition and we said that Joe is in a new place. He's healed. He is free now from drugs and all of the problems that that occur when a person uh, walks down the road and the family knows this, this is a public thing, walks down the road in to drugs and is unable to turn around. Even if he had uh, overdoses before, he always would say, well, I'm going to do it, but I couldn't do it. So some people can do it, but you can be sure that we say in the Apostles' Creed, uh, he descended into hell and he's going to meet uh, uh, Joe uh, even in hell and bring him back uh, because Joe is one of his uh, wayward children. And so it is then that we uh, 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 receive now the offering, remembering that God gives us every good thing, including the life which we share together. Father, we commit these gifts, remembering that they are but a small portion of the gifts of life and love that you have given us. 
Guide the hands of those that use them, that they may be used to proclaim the gospel throughout this community and throughout the world. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. A beautiful thing that is happening to us during this Lenten season is to hear the testimony of two men <clears throat> who've grown up uh, in the Canton area, Canton Highland Town. They're both Canton Highland Town gems. One of them, of course, is Max Hoffman, whom you're going to hear from following uh, the reading of the scripture, uh, but also uh, next week. You're going to hear from Father Joe uh, from St. Bridges. So here we have a Roman Catholic guy raised in the community and a, and a, and a person who was in the Protestant church and a part of our church and was a, a person who <clears throat> grew up to finally discover a whole new role. And so he has a beautiful story and a journey, a journey of faith to share. And so I've chosen to read today uh, some passages uh, from the 52nd chapter of Isaiah, because each person who testifies and witnesses, as a, whether as an individual lay person or a pastor, is beautiful. Because, you see, you are specially chosen by God to tell the story of the good news in a world that is sometimes often and often dark, you see. And people need to be lifted up. And that's what the good news is all about. So listen to these words now from Isaiah, from the seventh chapter to the tenth chapter, or to the seventh uh, verse to the tenth verse. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger who announces peace, who brings good news, who announces salvation, and who says to Zion, your God reigns. Listen, your sentinels lift up their voices, and together they sing for joy. For in plain sight they see the return of the Lord to Zion. Break forth together in singing. You ruins of uh, Jerusalem, break forth together in singing. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. The word of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ. I am Deacon Max Hoffman, a member of St. Michael Lutheran Church in Perry Hall, Maryland. When I transferred there a number of years ago, they thought I was Lutheran. And I didn't know that I wasn't. So between the two of us, we're, we got along famously, and I'm still there. But now I am a Lutheran. My call to my ministry of, as an associate in ministry, a deacon in the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, was planned by God from the word go. From the time I was baptized, he had a plan. I had wanted to be a pastor as long as I could remember, but God had different plans for me. 
I'm a Canton boy. Once a Canton boy, always a Canton boy. I will die a Canton boy. As the oldest son of immigrant parents, I had it pretty tough at first. Our family moved into a Polish neighborhood, Bolden Street between O'Donnell and Elliott. And it was an inopportune time because Nazi Germany had just invaded Poland and had taken her over. And our new neighbors were incensed and were about to get even. Unfortunately, I was it. I was the new kid on the block, and beside that I was German all the way through. A new pecking order was going to be installed on Bolden Street. Well, sadly to say, they didn't know that I was a pretty good fighter, and I became king of the block and made many Polish friends. I didn't like to fight. I thought it was kind of stupid. And when I started something, I gave it everything I had, every ounce of energy, everything that was in my mind, soul, and spirit was into that particular endeavor. My mind just would not consider losing. And to this day, I cannot accept losing. From those early moments of my childhood, I believe God set my ways. I know myself to be optimistic, a positive thinker, very determined. Now, my wife has another word for that. She calls it a blockhead or bullheaded, but nevertheless, I am determined. I like that word better. I'm also one who loves people, and I want to be loved by people. I will do everything in my power to make people like me, because I love them. I was no angel, however. I can recall many things for which I begged God for forgiveness, and he did. There were also those times that I did not act in a very gentlemanly manner and for which I still carry the guilt. God has forgiven me, but for some reason I still have not been able to forgive myself for my actions. And that's sad in a way because it's so available. As I grew up, I felt the call of God very strongly in my life. There were no sudden outbursts of emotion. There was nothing that suddenly pushed into the front that I had to do something. But I did feel God drawing me to himself. I felt God that had chosen me and he was taking me by the hand and leading me through life. He was using a machete to clear away the junk and the weeds and the undergrowth of that thing, that jungle called life. He was leading me toward a journey and a calling I never dreamed of, to a calling I had never even heard of. I had to quit school when I was 16. Times were tough and the family needed help, and my dad, who I loved dearly, asked me if I would help and assist, and I did. I didn't want to, but I had to help. There were those times when I occasionally would sneak away from school and I had an opportunity 
to walk to where my dad worked on Constitution Street by the prison and watch him work. He was a master mechanic. And I used to love to watch him as he shaped pieces of metal, shaving off, forming into what he wanted, something that was perfect. And I think from my dad, I gained a little of that perfection. I wanted my life to become like that metal my father was shaping. And one of my favorite hymns, a hymn that I had sung when I was ordained a deacon, was this song, this hymn. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I'm waiting, yielded and still. I'm still being molded this very evening. Even now, as my dad was shaping that steel, God was shaping me into what he wanted me to become the purpose that he had for me. I got into trouble with God. During World War II, I was a combat infantryman in Europe. And I saw things and I heard things that I couldn't understand. I couldn't tolerate. I couldn't comprehend what was taking place. How could God allow such destruction of men and women and children in such a vast scale? I came home. I was a different person. God was name only. He was in my background. And there was only one person who noticed that I was different than when I had gone away. And that's our choir director, Mrs. Alva Whitliffe. Somehow or other, that woman was able to see inside of me and saw that I was different. I explained to her my relationship with God and what it was. And we talked about it several times. She never pushed me, and she never condemned me. She continued to love me, and I remember that. I don't know when, but somewhere, somehow, I once again walked into the outstretched hands of my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ. This time, we began to walk the road that he had laid out for me from the beginning. This was a road on which I never felt alone. To this day, I have never felt alone. God has been with me through the power of that Holy Spirit that has been placed inside my heart and my soul. I sense the presence of God all the time. Why God reached out for me, I will never know. Who was I? I was a poor young man. I was literally uneducated. I didn't have too much love for God at that point in time. My wife-to-be broke up with me because I wasn't a very pleasant person. I had become a loner. And yet, somehow, that journey continued. Somewhere along the line, God held on to my hand firmly. He would not turn me loose. And he began to lead me forward. I had no idea as to what I was going to do with my life. My friends had good paying jobs at the defense plants. I was unable to get a job there because of my physical disability, so I didn't know what I was going to be doing. 
But God opened my eyes to a possible job in a coffee plant which was being opened up in Baltimore, downtown. So I said, why not? My father had me lined up as an electrician's apprentice, and I didn't want any parts of that. My hands and dirt just do not agree with one another. I don't like greasy hands or sticky fingers, and that's all I could see, and I dreaded it. So when this opportunity to come as a laborer, I grabbed it, and I held on to it. And my dad almost had a hemorrhage. I looked at the people that I was working with, and I saw that most of them were old. I said, well, this is perfect. They can't last much longer. They're going to die or quit or do something. So there's plenty of opportunity for promotion. I stayed and I stayed and I stayed. I stayed for 51 years until I was retired. God was on a roll. He took care of my livelihood. Now he wanted to work on my education. He still had something in mind for me, but I didn't know it. I still had the dream of becoming a pastor, but somewhere along the line, God's Holy Spirit touched my heart, and that dream was rekindled. That which had been placed in the background came to the foreground. Go back to school. Finish your high school. Oh, boy. Polytechnic, here I come. Five years at night. Only to find out that I had been out of school since I was 16, and that was too long, and all those credits that I had taken at night were no longer accepted. I had to get a thing called GED, which I had never even heard of. I said, well, that's the end of that, and so I quit. I then decided that I would begin studying at the Baltimore Institute as an accountant, a possible CPA, because I was growing with the company and I had taken over the office. I was involved with accounts receivables, payables, auditing, and the like. And so that would come in handy. It also would enable me to become a member of the Baltimore, uh, University of Baltimore, because they accepted the credits. My last semester at the Baltimore Institute, that nasty Three letters came up again. I needed my GED. So I got an application blank and two Saturdays I took the exam. I passed. The only thing was I felt my brains had been sucked dry. It's not like it is now where you get tutored and everything. They just give you thing, the uh, application. You went in there and you sat and hallelujah. <laughs> I finally graduated, only to find out that University of Baltimore no longer accepted credits from Baltimore Institute. So I said, oh boy, Lord, what are you doing? You know, you're opening and shutting doors so fast, and, you know, I'm getting shell-shocked. But he had a plan. It was obvious that he did not want me to become a CPA. There were delays when I finally entered the University of Baltimore. I was promoted. I had to take 17 selected courses at International Business School. Then I had to take courses at Tulane University in Louisiana. I had to take a number of courses at the University of Louisiana at New Orleans. I took all those. And I heard those doors opening and closing, opening and closing. 
Oh, yes, I, I felt his hand at work. I did. But I didn't know what kind of work he was up to. I didn't know where he was leading me. I got fired in New Orleans as a plant manager. I had been praying that the Lord would take care of my family there because when we left here, we went into a hornet's nest with civil riots and uprisings in New Orleans, unrest, cuttings in the schools, and my children were afraid to go to school. And I kept praying, Lord, help me out of this. And I got fired. And I immediately laughed to myself because I knew God was at work. And on my way home, I said, well, Lord, you answered my prayer. Not quite like I expected, but you did answer my prayer. I called Baltimore, a friend of mine who had told me that if I ever needed work, I would have it. I called him and he said, yes, you've got a job, Max. I don't know what it is, but you've got one. I talked to my wife, Marge, and I said, okay, hon, what do we need to live on when I get this new job? And she told me. She gave me a figure. And when I got the new job, it was within one dollar of what we needed. Here again, I had to laugh. Well, God, you did it again. You had to show me that you're in charge. You wouldn't give me the whole thing. You held out one stinking dollar but I knew he was at work. Back to school. Finally, this wonderful year, 1976, I finally made it. I graduated, but now I was 50 years old. Well, that lets seminary out. Who wants an old man? After my workings with the coffee company, my promotions, I was pretty well set in life. and My children were growing up. I couldn't afford to throw it all away and go to seminary, so I thought it was all over. But then God steps into the picture again. He starts playing mind games with me. He wouldn't give me any peace. He was always talking to me, chattering, chattering, chattering. I'm not finished with you. I'm not finished with you. I'm not finished with you. Okay, God, if you're not finished with me, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? No answer. And I kept saying, you're talking, but you're not saying anything. It was almost funny, but it wasn't funny. I finally went to my pastor. I said, I got a problem. God's trying to tell me something, but he won't tell me. He says he's got something for me to do, but he won't tell me what it is. Pray for me. So we prayed, and then he prayed, and I prayed, and about a month later, he handed me a little piece of paper about the size of a postage stamp. And it had a name and phone number on it. I called that number, and the gates of heaven seemed to burst wide open. I could see the angels dancing and singing paper led me to the order of St. Stephen Deacon in the Lutheran Church in America. They had a program for people just like me. My church, St. Michael, issued me a preliminary call, three years of additional study. 1979, I was ordained a deacon, and I was ecstatic. God had finally revealed his plan to me. I had recognized him at work in my life. I knew that all along. But he would, never, he would never tell me what he was up to. But most importantly, I responded even to those little blind gestures that he was making. I responded. I acted. And a dream finally came true. God's plan was for me to be a servant, a deacon, not a shepherd of a flock. I preach. I teach. I visit the sick. 
I counsel. I work with those who are in grief over the loss of a loved one. I perform at weddings. I assist with communion. I baptize. I love my Lord with my whole heart. And through those things that he has called me to do, I know he loves me. He is using me to serve his purpose and further glorify in some small way his name. I am a Lutheran deacon, an associate in ministry. There are many strengths in the Lutheran tradition. The Bible, this wonderful word of God, infallible, inerrant. God is a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one. Man and woman, created in holiness, becoming sinners who cannot return to God except through Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord, who shed his blood and died on a cross and rose again on that wonderful third day. It's a church of people who sincerely accept and believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We believe baptism establishes a new life. The Lord's Supper is a sacrament. This is the body and blood of Christ born by bread and wine and Holy Communion. We believe in God's law. We believe that we are all sinners and can only be saved through the grace of God. We believe the gospel, the teachings of Jesus, offering grace to everyone and will save those who believe its promises. We believe in prayer, all oh, that wonderful means by which we can communicate with our Father and with our Lord and Savior. We believe faith is an acceptance of Christ as Savior. We also believe the spirit of evil, Satan, is the enemy of God and the church and its people. We believe religious education is the responsibility of the home and church. We believe marriage is intended to be for life until death do us part. I chose St. Michael because it taught me all those things which had already been taught me when I was growing up at Botts's this very congregation. These are the things that I was taught by people of God. May Getz, Mr. Zimmerman, Mr. Albert Witzke, Sister Lena, and others on and on. And these are the same things that I preach and teach. This is the kind of life that I try to live. There is a type of Christ living within me, and I want him to come out. It was a life that was expressed to me by my parents, by my pastors, by Mr. Witzke, by my boss at work. And then there was that little bit of extra that God sprinkled in just to make me a little bit different than the others, making me who I am. Who am I? A non-deserving child of God, called to be a servant, called to take a journey of faith, to serve as a deacon in his church. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, guard and protect your hearts and your lives. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen.
may be seated. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Father, we pray for your universal church and for God's people throughout the world and for our own United Evangelical Church that we may be filled with your Holy Spirit and through the power of your Son, Jesus, we all may be one. We pray for all ministers, priests, and apostles, and today, especially for Max Hoffman, that they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments, and with joy and thanksgiving, go forth to tell the great things that you have done for us all. Now we remember uh, those who have uh, been suffering from any grief or trouble. Have compassion upon them that they may be delivered from their distress and find a happy issue out of every affliction. And so we pray tonight with thanksgiving for the healing of Walter Kellner. Be with the family of Mark Strobel and Joe Lambert tonight. Comfort Bill and Carrie and Charles and Josephine and Lori and John Bushman and Charlie and Trudy and Kate and Art and Lois and Danielle and family and friends and all the chemotherapy patients and our beloved Baltimore. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored by a lively faith and especially for Max Hoffman, whom we raise up in honor today, that his faith may continue to be the light of the world. We pray that we too may have the grace to glorify Christ, each one in our own day. We thank you, Father, for the gift of faith in Jesus Christ our Lord, and especially for the service to this church, as shown in the work of Darlene Waters, a work which has been such a blessing to our community of faith. And now we remember those who have gone before us in the faith and who now live eternally with thee. We remember especially those in whose names memorials have been given and for whom love gifts have been presented, as we say. O oh God, before whom the generations rise and pass away, we praise you for all your servants who, having lived this life in faith, now live eternally with you. And especially do we thank you for uh, Mark George Strobel and for Joseph Lambert, for the gift of their lives and for the grace that you have given them and for all that in them was good and kind and faithful. We thank you that for them is de uh, death is past and pain is ended and they have entered the joy that you have prepared through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us when we gathered together to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. tonight for this wonderful opportunity we have for sharing and getting to know one another and for Darlene's work and of course for Max's sharing with us this, uh, this evening. But we'd like to also have you come and join with us a little bit, have a little coffee and whatever <laughs> uh, and, and a little fellowship and if some of you would like to talk with Max, he will be available immediately after the service. And now Max is going to lead us in the first benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now peace I leave with you, my friends. Peace that the world cannot give. Peace I leave with you, my friends, so that your joy may be forever full. Be strong now and be of good courage. Fight the good fight, finish the race, and keep the faith. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you now and forever. Amen. Amen.